Okay, here we are, and we are back for our second lecture. Uh, so I was starting it back here again. This is, a, again, if you haven't done so, I'd print this out, uh, review it. Uh, I'm going to be asking a lot of these um, uh, you're going to see things like uh, which of the following is an amino acid derivative, which of these is a catecholamine, which of these is a thyroid hormone, um, uh, things like that, which of these is uh, amino acid derivative, which of these is a glycoprotein, which of these is a short polypeptide, which of these is a peptide hormone, which of these is a, an eicosanoid, which of these is a steroid, which of these is a lipid derivative, uh, those kinds of things. So uh, definitely pay extra attention to that. That is six points right there of the test. Um, so, and one of each will be in the one, two, three different major chemical classifications. So, what we want to look at now is to uh, continue on and look at factors that regulate how a hormone itself can interact with its own receptor. Now, we already know that it's the structure of the hormone that allows um, the um, uh, hormone to bind, uh, that hormone has a very unique shape, and that the protein, receptor protein, has a unique shape that allows it to bind with that unique hormone. Now, one thing is, if there is a bunch of hormone, if there is a high level of that hormone in the bloodstream, then that hormone will be binding to more receptors, right? There's how much of the hormone is circulating in the blood will determine how many hormones are bound to receptors. Or the number of receptors on target cells. If there's more receptors, there's more impact. Case in point, if you were to have a, if a cell needs to be able to have a major impact, from a hormone, but these hormones are not very high levels in the blood, then you need to have a lot more receptors. And that does happen a lot where we can adjust the number of receptors to adjust the impact. Uh, that's kind of how we get, uh, how different levels of estrogen in the blood can cause the release of LH uh, or not, uh, is based on the number of receptors on target cells. Uh, the affinity, how strong is it based on its shape? There, uh, now, uh, we've already actually covered a great example of this. We saw that norepinephrine had a great affinity for alpha receptors and that there is a strong affinity Affinity, a strong attraction chemically there uh, due to potentially to the locations of hydrogens um, on polar parts of those molecules uh, may have strong amounts of hydrogen bonding that will cause them to strong, bind, bind very strongly. Now, we inactivate a hormone. When it binds to a receptor, it's not doing anything else. It's just working there. Uh, so that's one thing. A hormone is no longer active. Once it's gotten to its receptor, its job is done. Kind of like how a runner is no longer running after he crosses the finish line. He's Now he may continue on to do a cool down run, but he's done. The race is over. You cross the finish line. When the uh, when a receptor is uh, bound by, when a hormone binds to a receptor, the hormone is no longer active. Now it could detach and be considered active again. Okay, it can bind again. That's potential. Now, it will be broken down. The liver could break it down or the kidneys could remove it. That means your liver is going to go in and take this protein and with enzymes degrades it, breaks it down, takes it to an inactive structure, or the kidneys pee it out. And you will see hormones in urine. A great example of this is when we test for a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. We test for it in urine by peeing on a stick, and that stick has been impregnated with a material that to test for that, and it will give you, is it one line or two line, or a plus or a minus? Are you pregnant or not, pregnancy tests uh, to test for urine levels of a particular hormone or, or enzymes that are in the bloodstream itself, for example, can break down some of these um, as well. Now, case in point, your body, your uh, pancreas will produce a lot of insulin, but by the time that insulin that's in the blood goes pretty much straight to your liver, and you'll understand why when you guys get to uh, cardiovascular and lab and you'll see that the blood vessels that bring things from the pancreas and things go straight to the liver. And when it does that, the liver removes a whole big amount of insulin. 
And there's also enzymes in the blood that break down things, like monoamine oxidase might be going through the blood. And there's lots of enzymes, deactivator enzymes in the blood uh, for various uh, hormones uh, and, and other molecules, uh, things like that. So now steroids. Now let's go back to this drawing right here that I've done. <clears throat> and we want to make sure that you guys understand this. And I'm actually just going to recreate it again and do so a little bit smaller, uh, but also do a little bit more in detail about a couple of things. So if I've got a cell here, remember this cell, I have, for example, lipid hormones like steroids and non-lipid hormones. Now, if I've got a lipid hormone, let's say it's a steroid, for example, one, two, three, four, five, uh, four fuse rings, sorry, one, two, three, four <laughs> fuse rings. I can't count today either, apparently. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. Let me just erase that and start over because I absolutely just like that looks terrible. Um, I can't be satisfied with that. Okay. So one of the things organic chemistry taught me was how to draw hexagons. <laughs> anyway, um, so what we have here is our steroid. Now, the thing about this steroid, if it's in the blood right here, in order to get it into the blood, there's a problem. It is nonpolar. So that means there is no way for this to interact with water that's in the blood. So what we do is we use a molecule called a transport protein. A transport protein will always carry a lipid-soluble hormone, a lipid hormone, any lipid-soluble hormone through the bloodstream and keep it on there till it is delivered. And when it comes to this lipid hormone comes to the cell, it will pass straight through the cell membrane. Now let's use our classic example. Here we have a mitochondria. This is representing a mitochondria in the cell. And let's say there right here we have our receptor for this steroid and it binds to it and makes this guy make lots of ATP. So what we see is, is first thing is that lipid soluble hormones, lipid soluble hormones, they are transported through the blood using a transport protein. First things first on that. Now this is really crucial when it comes to something you guys are going to learn in pharmacology called the protein effect. So basically all you're going to do when you guys get to pharmacology, replace lipid soluble hormone with drug no different, okay? So it uses a transport protein. That's what the protein effect is. Basically, is anything that goes through the blood on a transport protein has a longer half-life, lasts longer in the bloodstream than something that doesn't. And it passes through the cell membrane and binds to a receptor on the outside. Now, here I have a non-lipid protein. Non-lipid, uh, this is maybe a protein, like a protein, like a uh, something like that, uh, amino acid that's, that's water-soluble. So since it's water-soluble, uh, it's just floating around, and he's going to have a receptor located on the outside of the cell, and it will bind to this receptor protein. Now, what is interesting, we call this the first messenger. Remember, he's first. First messenger is the hormone. Hormone is first messenger. He binds to this receptor protein, and inside this receptor protein is a molecule, set of molecules, usually a complex, called the second messenger. Okay? And the second messenger system will lead to the effect inside the cell, okay? So this means that non-lipid soluble proteins use second messenger systems. 
and receptors found on the outside. Lipid soluble cis, uh, hormones do not use second messengers. Their uh, hormones transport on, in the blood on, on um, uh, transport proteins, pass through cell membrane, and bind to receptors on the inside of the cell on an organelle. So those are the, all the big things there that we need to make sure we understand. So if steroid hormone, they're fat lipid soluble. It means they're nonpolar. So it means they don't have a charge. If they don't have a charge, they can't interact with water who is polar. If water is polar, water has a positive end and a negative end. And that means that there is no opposite for the water to attract on this protein, on this, on this hormone, the nonpolar hormone. So this nonpolar hormone, if it's not positive or negative, it can't interact with the positive or the negative end of water, so it means it can't interact with water. So if it can't interact with water, it can't interact with blood, can't dissolve in the blood. So that means we have to take it and bring it through on a transport protein or carrier protein, something like albumin in the bloodstream. And it goes through on a protein, and then it passes through the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, and passes through. And for example, if it were to bind the nucleus, it could cause the nucleus to say, hey, nucleus, let's start doing transcription, translation, produce a protein. Nucleus, let's do mitosis. So this will cause mitosis to happen. And that's both of those topics, protein synthesis and mitosis, were things we talk about in chapter three. Now, or the mitochondria, for example, could cause ATP production. Again, chapter three, we saw the mitochondria brings in oxygen, organic compounds like glucose, and produces ATP and carbon dioxide and water. Now, if you're non-steroid or non-lipid, water-soluble hormone, you're water-soluble. At least most of them are water-soluble. There are some who aren't, um, but um, and that's rare, but most are. And what they'll do is they just go through the blood. They don't need a transport protein. They don't need a kind of carrier protein to grab them through uh, because they can interact with the blood. But because they are not lipid soluble and they are water soluble, when they hit the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, they're going to go towards it and they're going to be repelled by it because opposites attract, but same repel. Well, eh, uh, that's not going to be working here. I uh, apologize for that. That was, I was about something completely different, so scratch what I just said. Um, anyway, let me step back and fix what I just said, what I just stepped on. Uh, it's a good thing I got my coffee in my hand. Okay, so what we're going to see is that because these substances, guys, are water-soluble, they have a charge. There is no charge to the fatty acids. So in order to dissolve in something, you have to be the same. Like dissolves like. So that means, though, water is polar. Steroid hormones are polar. They can dissolve in each other. So it doesn't need a protein to go through the blood. But because the nonpolar substance in the cell membrane is there, and the, not, and the polar hormone is there, it tries to go through phospholipid bilayer and it can't, so it must use a receptor on the outside of the cell called an external or an extracellular receptor. And they have second messengers. That is a G protein. Now remember G protein. My analogy for G protein has been this throughout the entire uh, uh, first three chapters. So hormone is you. Second messenger's little brother or little sister. You have snuck out of the house to try to go to a, a concert. You are now trying to sneak back in without getting caught by mommy and daddy. So you go, uh, you go to your win bedroom window and the window's locked. So you knock on the bedroom window and try to get little brother or little sister to let you in. Now they could be cool little brother or little sister let you in the window. Come on in. They could be mean little brother or little sister and tell mommy and daddy on you or let you freeze out in the cold. So depending upon what they are uh, is uh, going to depend upon the action. Okay, So it depends on the second messenger, which is G-proteins. G-proteins are second messengers. Okay, 
So that is going to be a G protein. I'm just going to write G there. G. It's a G protein. Okay. Cool beans. <clears throat> All right. I hope that makes sense. Definitely spend some time thinking about this sketch I did here. This is very useful, but this is very big deal information to go on through courses like pharmacology. If you don't understand this, you're going to have a really hard time understanding things like protein effect, things like that when you guys do lipid-soluble versus non-lipid-soluble drugs. And if you take this, just replace hormone with drug, and you're good to go. Okay? Cool beans? Cool beans. Okay. Now, non-steroid hormones, catecholamines, these guys use extracellular receptors. They go in and they the hormone's the first messenger, and it uses the second messenger. So non-lipid soluble, non-steroid uh, hormones, they use second messengers. It's the lipid solubles who don't. Now, the second messenger, there's a lot of them, but this is second messengers are used by any hormone who doesn't enter the cell. Here we have a hormone binding to a receptor, and we have a G protein. And this G protein comes in and activates it. Now, this is the classical and most important one that you can learn about. Okay, this is CAMP system. That is the one you really need to know. Now, phosphoinositol system and arachidonic acid system, arachidonic acid, you're, you just need to know those are types of second messengers. CAMP is the one I want you guys to know. PDE, for example, you will see many drugs that are PDE inhibitors, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. A good example of one of those is actually a gradient in Viagra is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Uh, I believe it's a non-competitive inhibitor of, of, of um, sulfagyl citrate. Um, the enzyme uh, that, that is a non-competitive inhibitor of PDE, um, my understanding. It is a PD inhibitor. I think it's non-competitive. Um, anyway, uh, but you'll be using that for people who have heart issues, things like that. So not Viagra, but you can. Uh, but you guys will be using PDE inhibitors and things like that with heart patients. So just so make sure you guys understand it. And you really need to understand this CAMP signaling system. So I'm going to sketch it, and then I'm going to talk about it. So and then I'm going to show you guys the notes. So let's sketch it. So let's say I've got a cell right here. Here we have a cell in the body. This could be any cell in the body that we have that is capable of responding to. Uh, so what we're going to do is let's use norepinephrine. And right here, this receptor, let's say this is an alpha receptor. Norepinephrine is going to come in and bind to that receptor. Now, norepinephrine here is, remember, it's a catecholamine. It's not a lipid. So it's water-soluble. So when it binds here, we need to have a G protein. I'm just going to abbreviate him GP. G protein. Now, this G protein that is present here, what happens when norepinephrine binds? When something binds to a protein, protein changes its shape. When protein changes its shape, that may release uh, something here, okay? It may cause a release, an activation, okay? When it does that, there is usually associated nearby here an enzyme complex, and I'm going to abbreviate AC. It stands for adenylate cyclase. ACE says this is an enzyme, adenylate cyclase. Now, what does adenylate cyclase do? Now, adenylate cyclase, as we're going to see here, is going to take a molecule called ATP, which we should know about ATP, ATP that the cell has, and adenylate cyclase turns ATP into cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Okay? Cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Now, if we want to go back here to ATP, there is ways to do that. Now, the only way to go to take CAMP, um, <clears throat> and uh, we, could, we could go do that, but CAMP, if we want to inactivate that, uh, let me just do this. Here we go. <clears throat> Let's just do this. So CAMP, because uh, we'll, I just want to use PDE to turn off CAMP. 
Okay, so uh, I'm not going to worry about the cycle there. Now, camp can go do a handful of things here. Camp is very interesting. Camp, basically, there's two major things camp will do. One of the things camp might do is, let's say, camp added a calcium channel here. And calcium could come into this cell, for example, and stimulate the cell to, say, release something. Okay, Camp uh, activity, if this was a heart muscle cell and calcium were to come in, that would make that calcium, that would make that heart muscle cell contract more intensely. Or this could increase and decrease enzyme functions. Okay, enzymes. So what you're basically seeing here is, is um, your second messenger can lead to the opening of calcium channels or turning on or off enzymes throughout the cell, depending on what the enzymes are. And then if I want to turn this off and I want to take camp and turn camp off, I use a molecule called PDE, phosphodiesterase, PDE, will come in and shut camp off, which undoes everything that camp was doing, okay? So PDE is what turns camp off. So a PD inhibitor would prevent the closing of these channels, things like that, right? So, uh, so if you had a PD inhibitor, and prevented the closing, of, um, and um, PDE would cause those channels to close, which would cause blood vessels to relax instead of being contracted. And this would cause, this is how Viagra works. Viagra comes in and it activates PDE, keeps it from happening. Um, so, uh, or keeps, um, it's a PDE inhibitor and keeps you from inactivating camp. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Okay, I uh, just want to talk about that very briefly because you guys will learn about some things in, in uh, pharmacology. I'll make sure you guys have that. Okay, so um, be, definitely study this. Uh, one of the things I'm going to ask you on my test uh, that I could ask you guys is I may have the steps. I said, what happens immediately after this? Okay, you will see camp signaling system on my test. Okay, so as we said, if you're a steroid hormone, you'll pass straight through the phospholipid bilayer, bind to a receptor inside the cell, maybe on an organelle or just somewhere. It could bind to a mitochondria. You yeah, can do that too. Thyroid hormone, same thing. And this will make the cell produce ATP. For example, this is why you feel so tired if you have hypothyroidism. So if something is lipid-soluble, hydrophobic, it passes straight through the cell membrane. Right through the plasma membrane, right through the membrane lipids. It diffuses through it. Okay. Now, thyroid hormones can use some transport mechanisms to get across. So it is one of the few that is going in. Um, so now these hormones, because they need to be carried by a protein, they last longer. They have what's called a longer half-life. Okay. <clears throat> now. Endocrine reflex. What is an endocrine reflex? What an endocrine reflex is, is whatever causes a hormone to release. Now, there's many things that can cause a hormone release. Now, let's just think a little bit about this. Now, humoral. What's a humoral stimulus? What's humor? Humor is body fluids. If something in your body fluids, your ECF, if the levels change. Now, let's just say, for example, the calcium levels go up or down. If calcium levels go up or down, the body needs to release calcitonin or parathyroid hormone to affect the change. Glucose levels. If you've got high glucose, low glucose, things like that. I know that should be a comma. <laughs> it was bugging me. Um, so if you have glucose, for example, that changes. These things change. That's a humoral stimulus. So that's just something in the body fluids. ECF changes, levels, concentrations change. And there's lots of mechanisms that can cause that. There's a really cool, I actually have a video of the humoral stimulus for the release of, of insulin on my YouTube channel. 
Now, hormonal stimulus, this is where a hormone it comes in or is removed. If a hormone is added or removed, it can cause a hormone to be produced or reduced. For example, if you, uh, if you bring in growth hormone, you cause cells division to increase. If you bring in growth hormone inhibiting hormone, you prevent the growth hormone actions. Neural stimulus, your neurotransmitter can be coming in a neuroglandular junction causing actions uh, for some gland cells. And some endocrine glands even can be stimulated directly neurally or they could be stimulated humorally or hormonally. Uh, and this is three major things that cause endocrine glands to release hormones. Now, this is a very big deal here. Tropic versus non-tropic. Tropic versus non-tropic. I want to help you guys understand this. So what is the difference between tropic and non-tropic hormones? Well, let's start off here. So let's say I've got, I've got two glands here, and here's a gland here. These are going to be two endocrine glands. I don't know. Uh, okay, I'm back to a very, very low internet connection momentarily. Um, so I don't know how long this is going to take and if it will actually stay connected. There we go. So uh, we have two endocrine glands. Now on this one, what we're going to do is we are going to... Uh, um, <clears throat> On this one, put another gland, and then over here, we're going to put a target cell here. Target, target. Okay, so the first one here, I have one gland, and this gland releases hormones, okay? And then these hormones arrive to a second gland to cause that gland to release hormones. And those hormones go to the target. So this right here, where you have two glands involved in a sequence, that is a tropic hormone. Tropic hormones, these are tropic hormones. Uh, tropic is you have one gland causes another gland to release hormones to impact the target cell. Now, what about here? This hormone here, this gland here releases hormones. These hormones go straight to the target cell and do their thing. This would be non-tropic. So tropic glands have, uh, they have a, a multiple glands. One gland releases hormones to go to another gland to make it release hormones to go to the target cell. Where non-tropic, the gland releases hormones directly to the target cell, okay? So this is a big deal in um, understanding some major uh, endocrine issues that you guys may deal with, especially like, you know, uh, stuff that affects the reproductive system is involved in tropic, tropic hormones. For example, there's a hormone. So if I'm looking at this drawing right here, uh, GNRH could be this hormone right here. So let's say this was GNRH. These hormones here were FSH and LH, and this was the gonads. Well, that would be an example of tropic. Here we have, if we had insulin, and then here we have a uh, liver cell. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'm getting a little drink of my coffee. Okay, so we're going to be getting into the anatomy of the glands. The anatomy is pretty simple, but it's going to be on top of it some complicated things. So we want to help you guys understand that. So here we have the hypothalamus. Um, hypothalamus, I'm going to be talking about a little bit. I kind of wish I did the hypothalamus here first and then, but hypothalamus remember you have the thalamus right here's the thalamus here's the hypothalamus below the hypothalamus is the pituitary and the hypothalamus uh, is basically a connection it is kind of like two parts it is part of the nervous system and it's part of the endocrine system because it produces some hormones but it produces so what does it do it does the autonomic function so remember this is the autonomic integration center if you remember, if you had me for AMP1, you remember that hypothalamus controls the four 
F's. Feeding, fighting, flighting, and fornicating. So this is controlling things like your body temperature, though, your thirst, your hunger, sexual behaviors, fear, fee, fight, fight, and fornicate. Okay? Fee, fight, fight, and fornicate is what I always like to say. Now, that kind of helps you get the major things it does. Now, it releases releasing hormones. And what does a releasing hormone do? Releasing hormone will come out of the hypothalamus and go to the anterior pituitary to cause the anterior pituitary to release something. An inhibiting hormone will come out of the hypothalamus, go to the anterior pituitary, and tell it to not release something. Okay? Now, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. What does anti mean? Anti means against. Diuretic. What does that mean? Diuretic means that this uh, diuresis means making pee. So what does this mean? It's against making pee. So if you're against making pee, what does it do is it retains water. Let's talk a little bit about that and so you can understand it better than me just talking about it. So let's say here I have a, a kidney. <clears throat> Well, before I do my kidney, I'm going to bug this. Uh, so right here, we're going to draw a little bit of a donut. And this donut represents all of your blood. This is your blood. Right here is all the blood in your body. And below that, uh, you have an organ who helps control the volume and composition of blood called a kidney. Now, one of the major things that uh, it, that we are going to affect is the amount of water in blood. Now, let's say there was too much water in blood. Let's say we had too much water in the blood. Blood is too diluted. Well, best thing we want to do here is pee all that out. Now, that means we're not going against your information. We're making a lot of pee. So that means there is no ADH here. Okay, no ADH going on here. Okay. ADH is not working. But <clears throat> let's take this one here. And let's say this patient here has very low water. They're dehydrated. Okay. They're dehydrated. We have a dehydrated patient, and this patient has functioning kidneys. So what's going to happen is I do not want to produce a lot of urine. So what I want to do is come in here with ADH and use ADH to stop water reabsorption. And this is going to allow the water to stay in the blood. Okay, It's going to keep me from making urine. ADH causes the retention of water at the kidneys, okay? So let's say here, this patient, you have drunk all the water they possibly can stand. So you need to pee a lot. So what you want to do, you want to get rid of water so you don't have excess water. This person here, if I dropped you out in the desert, now actually, you see what I kind of did here. I tried to be a little cute and make the blood... Uh, vessels a little smaller because they've lost fluid volume. <laughs> so, all right. So we don't want to pee that out. We've lost water. We want to retain it uh, using the kidneys. And that's what antidiuretic does. It retains water at kidney. Oxytocin. Oxytocin causes the reproductive tract, smooth muscles, the reproductive tract. We know the smooth muscles are there because we know the autonomic nervous system controls the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, and adipose. So that means it controls things like reproductive system, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, digestive system, all those systems that life support and reproductive, urinary, things like that. But it also lets milk let down the milk. It doesn't cause the production of milk. It makes the let down the milk in the female. Oxytocin makes milk ooze. Makes milk ooze. Makes you let milk out. Okay. Now, remember, there are releasing hormones. And I'm going to talk about these guys uh, here. Uh, the major releasing hormones that come from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary are thyroid-releasing hormone, TSH. Thyroid releasing hormone, uh, I mean THRH, causes the release of TSH from the anterior pituitary. GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, causes FSH and LH production 
release. Um, we're going to see later on actually what GNRH does is cause the production of FSH and LH, the release of FSH, but not the release of LH. That will be estrogen levels that will do that. Then we will see prolactin releasing hormone. Prolactin releasing hormone causes the release of prolactin from anterior pituitary, and corticoid releasing hormone CRH causes the release of ACTH. So these all tell you corticoids, ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, uh, and they go into an area here, a blood vessels, called the hypophyseal portal system. What's a hypophysis? Hypophysis is pituitary. And these are capillaries that are found in the infundibulum. If you guys have seen lab already, we'll talk about infundibulum a little bit later, but that's the stalk that holds the pituitary to the hy uh, hypothalamus called the hypophyseal portal system. And that's how these regulatory hormones make it from hypothalamus to anterior pituitary. So damaged here to the pituitary glands, stalk would cause the inability to take releasing hormones and send them to the anterior pituitary. Now inhibiting hormones inhibit anterior pituitary secretions. Now prolactin inhibiting hormone PIH inhibits prolactin. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone GH. This is also called somatostatin. Now case in point, I am going to ask you at least one alternate name of a hormone okay so when you see something slash something pay attention to those i will ask you one alternate name of a hormone uh, i wanted to show you something here um so you may have heard of belgian blues Belgian blue uh, bulls, uh, they have a myostatin inhibitor. Uh, they don't produce myostatin. Well, myostatin is a type of growth hormone. It's growth hormone for muscles specifically. So these guys here, the Belgian blues, you mean you look at them, they're like, do you even lift, bro? Uh, so what, we, what these guys are is they are enabled to respond to growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Uh, bully whippets. This is a bully whippet dog. Same thing goes on with bully whippets. Uh, bully whippets. Uh, and other dogs have had the same issues where they don't produce that. Uh, and uh, it's kind of terrifying. Myostat and uh, mutants are just buff. I mean, I imagine there's some people out there who might be myostat and mutant. <laughs> so, um, anyway. I always like showing that because I always find that just fascinating to me. So anyway, uh, now oxytocin. Oxytocin is involved in lactation. It makes milk ooze. The milk let down. Oxytocin lets down milk. So mama produces milk with another hormone we're going to talk about. This now lets it be released. And also during orgasm... Smooth muscle contractions during an orgasm is also oxytocin. So oxytocin makes milk ooze and causes orgasms. Antidiuretic hormone ADH keeps water retained. Now they are made in the hypothalamus, but they are stored and released in posterior pituitary. Let me show you what I mean. They're made here in these cell bodies of neurons. The cell body, the axons travel down to where their synaptic terminals are. And at the end of the synaptic terminals, the oxytocin and ADH made by these neurons are stored and released at, by vesicles in synaptic terminals, which makes these guys, essentially put, makes these endocrine. Because these neurons release into the blood. And here you can see that. Neurons are synaptic terminals are right there on the blood. Okay? Right there on blood vessels. All right. <clears throat> now, so they're, store, they're produced in the hypothalamus, but they're released and stored by the posterior pituitary. And you can see that here as well. Okay? Direct production released down here. Then stored and released from here, where the ADH goes to the kidneys, oxytocin goes to the reproductive tract, 
uh, things like that. <clears throat> okay. So, and the rest of it's anterior pituitary. And lots of crossover. Now, anterior pituitary has two lobes. The two lobes are the anterior and posterior pituitary of the pituitary gland, the hypothesis. The pituitary gland, I think I might mistakenly said the anterior pituitary has two lobes. The pituitary gland has two lobes. Now, the name for the pituitary is the hypothesis. So, there is an anterior pituitary called the adenohypothesis. Adenoadeno. Adeno, A for anterior, A for adeno. The word adeno, you may have heard of adenoid. Uh, when people have said they had their glands removed from their nose, well, uh, the adenoid, uh, the, the um, um, uh, pharyngeal tonsil. Well, anyway, the uh, uh, adenohypothesis is the glandular one. It makes most of the nine hormones. The posterior pituitary is getting neurons coming down from the hypothalamus so it's called the neurohypothesis or posterior pituitary now the posterior pituitary's neurons arrive from two places either the supraoptic nucleus or paraventricular nucleus now what do we mean by a nucleus a nucleus is a collection of neuron cell bodies in the central nervous system since we're in the hypothalamus we're in the brain we're in the central nervous system so a collection of neurons here that produce antidiuretic hormone are produces supraoptic nucleus why because it's above the optic chiasm paraventricular nucleus because it's on the side of the ventricle and these come down from those nuclei, bundles of these neurons, distinctively paraventricular makes oxytocin, superoptic makes ADH, so the ADH made up of this superoptic nucleus will come down and be released here to the posterior pituitary to general circulation. And then here, uh, um, you can actually go into uh, the bloodstream. Now, uh, and I'm just going to say here, because it doesn't go into hypo hypothalamic hypothesis portal system, and I'm just going to say blood. Uh, that is was not correct um, on on my end, and I apologize. Because um, it doesn't, uh, hypothesis portal system's up here, capillary beds here. That's for the regulatory hormones, and you can see that's separate, and there's a reason. This does go into uh, general circulation. And I apologize for that typo. I do know it's just sometimes you'll type things and it comes out that way and then you don't see it until you're teaching it. And I keep telling myself I need to fix it. I need to fix it. And now I'm going to do it because I'm recording it. Now, the portal vessels link capillaries together. They allow regulatory hormones to go to the anterior pituitary ever before they leave and go to the body. So it's sometimes called the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system, but that's a very important network of capillaries right here is the hypophyseal portal system, okay? The hypophyseal portal system right here, this bit, okay? Okay. Now, remember, there are the adenohypothesis, most of the nine hormones are there, and they're all controlled by negative feedback. That means when the hormone levels get too high in the blood, that hormone is production is shut off. They are all peptides and they all use second messengers. Of the hormones released, the anterior pituitary, uh, five of them are tropic. ACTH, FSH, TSH, GH, LH. All of those will go to other glands and tell those glands to release another hormone. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do, let's talk about ACTH. ACTH, let's break that down. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Now, we know that there's a hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. We know there's an anterior pituitary. And then down here, I've got a target cell. Now, the hypothalamus... And then here now, this guy here, ACTH, his target is adrenal cortex. Okay. Now, remember, we're talking about a hormone here that uh, is stimulated uh, by uh, CRH. Hypothalamus releases a hormone called CRH. 
corticoid releasing hormone. That makes the anterior pituitary then come in and release adreno ACTH, adreno corticotropic hormone. ACTH, adreno corticotropic hormone. And I don't need the, there we go. I don't need the little boop right there in the middle. Okay. And that will make, for example, cortisol. Now, let's say that as the cortisol levels rise, eventually these cortisol levels become so high that what I want to be able to do is take this elevated cort level and go back and shut off things like a hypothalamus and stuff like that via negative feedback. Shut it off, negative feedback, okay? So what you will actually begin to see is a negative feedback mechanism. Now, this is important to understand diseases like hypocorticoidism, like Cushing's, okay? So adrenocorticotropic hormonal corticotropin is released by cells of the anterior pituitary called the corticotropic cells. Its job is to go to the adrenal cortex, and it causes your things like your cortisols, your uh, glucocorticoids, right, in stress response. Now, this whole activation is when CRH, cortic uh, CRH is released, and then you will turn off basically the levels of CRH um, and turn that off. And this is negative feedback, okay? Now, <clears throat> the next one here is so let's take our uh let's again put our players in let's put hypothalamus and here pituitary down here will be thyroid thyroid now this would be important there to some thyroiditis things like that hyperthyroidism hypothyroidism uh thyroiditis things like that that you'll be helping to treat so here we have a hormone release from hypothalamus here called thyroid releasing hormone. Okay. Now thyroid releasing hormone will cause the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which will make the thyroid produce T3 and T4 hormones. And as the T3, T4 hormone levels rise here in the blood, you will note that this elevated level should come back to the hypothalamus and negative feedback. So we basically shut off TRH. In the same manner that we shut off CRH, okay? Okay, so these collectively, just so you guys know, are thyroid hormones. Okay. Now the gonadotropins. Let's talk about gonadotropins. Now gonadotropins, they are going to be much the same way. Our players in this one here, again, hypothalamus. And here, pituitary. And then down here will be the gonads. Gonads. Now, the hypothalamus releases a releasing hormone here. It's called gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH, which will cause the production of FSH and LH. But not the release of LH, actually, in, in females. In males it does, but not in females. Okay. Now, this will make sex hormones and gametes. Now, when the sex hormone levels become too high, the body is like, wait a minute, we don't need that. Let's take these sex hormones and go back and start to elevated sex hormones. We'll turn off GnRH, and that will turn off the production. Again, this is a negative feedback mechanism. 
Okay, these are the th uh, these three uh, are the important negative feedbacks that you are going to be required to know. Okay, these three for uh, hypo or hypergonadism, hypo and hyperthyroidism, uh, and hyper and hypo uh, uh, corticoidism. Okay, these are big things you'll deal with when you deal with endocrinology-based diseases in your programs. Okay, so I do want you to be quite familiar with these basic mechanisms. Now, how you learn it, I'm going to tell you there's no better way than really taking what I've done here and drawing them out, draw these milieus out repeatedly, okay, till you got them down. First thing I think everybody wants to do is first make sure you know the three major glands, the hormones released from each gland, the major results in what it's going to do, uh, the in target cells will release, and then that you shut off the regulatory gland with high levels. So really, it's not so bad. You just if you know the glands, know what they secrete, and you know CRH, you know TRH, and you know um, uh, GNRH. Those are the three most crucial ones that I can teach you for a lot of big diseases you may talk about in your future programs. All right, now FSH, follicle stimulating hormone produces sex cell formation. It's in female, it causes a follicle to produce, in male, it causes sperm. A good way that it to remember that it causes males to produce sperm. Sperm kind of look like little fish. And what do you call a fish with no eye? A fsh, FSH. A fsh, because that'd be a fish with no eye, is FSH. And that makes males little fishies. LH, luteinizing hormone, causes sex hormone production. For example, in males, it makes us make testosterone in males, so it makes us like hairy apes. Makes men like hairy apes. Oh, 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 testosterone. PRL, prolactin, or mammotropin. This actually targets the mammary glands and even the gonads. Milk production. We know that men, it helps us get more testosterone into the gametes, into the gonads, helps us produce more testosterone. And hypoprolactemia has seemed to show men to have uh, impotence. Um, GH, growth hormone or somatropin. Soma means body. Tropin means stimulatory, so it causes men's and women's bodies to grow. Uh, it targets your liver. Now, one of the reasons it targets liver is to help mobilize energy reserves in the liver and fat, liver and fat, to get mobilized metabolism. And so by that, to be able to actually handle growth and scale the muscles to grow and the bones to grow. GHRH uh, growth hormone releasing hormone turns it on. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone turns it off. Now, people who do not produce GHIH will keep growing and have gigantism. MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, this actually, call, or called melanotropin, causes the melanocytes to uh, be stimulated, causing melanin. Now, for people who have a disorder out there called Addison's disease, they have a lack of ability to do uh, anterior pituitary negative feedback. So usually they grow very tall. They have very high metabolism, so they're very skinny, tall, and they tend to be very dark complected because of that. And actually the most famous case of this condition uh, was, uh, was uh, JFK, JFK, John uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, former president. So uh, now the posterior pituitary member releases ADH and oxytocin. It, these hormones, ADH and oxytocin are made in the hypothalamus. They are stored and released by the posterior pituitary. Now, ADH has got a lot of different names to it, and I do want you to know these names, and it's important that you guys know because you'll be talking about people who have, uh, you'll be talking to doctors who have been doctors for 30 years, or doctors who have been doctors for five years, or, or you know, um, those long-term nurses, those new nurses, people who have been trained throughout different time frames, and you need to be competent to speak that language when you're in clinicals and things like that. Trust me when I say these things, and I know you think, ah, guys, uh, I've sent a lot of students to programs, and I know that's what you're going to see, and i got to prepare you, okay? So let me help you guys understand this. 
ADH, remember, is from superoptic nucleus. ADH, superoptic, sounds like a, a superhero, ADH. And hypothalamus, so water loss at kidney is reduced. So what does it do? It causes me to retain water. If I retain water, then what am I doing? Well, I'm increasing blood volume. So what stimulates this is when any time I've lost blood volume. Now, why might I lose blood volume? I might lose blood volume from bleeding. Yeah, I get a cut, I bleed. And then what happens is my blood volume is lost or I become severely dehydrated and blood is lost. And especially with dehydration, loss of fluid, I then increase my electrolyte concentrations. I now have more salty blood. The more salty blood and the loss of blood volume is being detected by chemoceptors in the body, osmoceptors in the body, and it will cause ADH to be released. And when it happens, ADH not only retains water, ADH becomes a vasoconstrictor. And this increases blood volume, blood pressure, and concentrated urine. Now, this is what happens. If you drink alcohol, I always say that beer is full of vitamin P. It makes you go pee. You have to pee a lot. You start flushing electrolytes because of all that urination. And what happens is... You get a hangover because you urinate all that out. You wake up in the morning. You feel really bad. Part of the hangover is is alcohol blocking ADH action cause you to lose and flush electrolytes causing the symptoms of a hangover along with other things. I mean, it's also uh, acetaldehyde uh, accumulating, things like that. But, you know, it's other chemicals, but that's part of it. Now, uh, so you concentrate your urine, you increase the blood volume, you increase your blood pressure, and it stops when we get back to normal. If my blood volume is normal, I, I, like I said, and you remember my drawing back here, okay? This drawing is going to help you understand that. So let's go back up to the top here. So here, if I have a lot of blood volume and I pee it out, and get to normal, then I, I I don't need ADH because I have too much fluid. Blood is too dilute. Here, when my blood volume was too low, blood was too concentrated, so we needed ADH to retain that water. And then I could start drinking, get thirsty, and start drinking water and things like that as well. It's one of the things that stimulates thirst. We'll talk more about that when we get to fluid balance, things like that. Um, I can't tell about every single thing there is in every single chapter, and I try to take everything and kind of pick and choose my battles at different chapters. Now, oxytocin. Oxytocin is released from the paraventricular nucleus. One of the ways I remember paraventricular releases oxytocin is, and it's involved in, you know, is, is somebody gets PO'd, PO'd, paraventricular oxytocin. It goes to the mammary glands, prostate, and reproductive tract, especially in males. Female reproductive tract as well. Males' prostates cause to contract here. This causes smooth muscle contractions during childbirth. This is what causes a woman to give birth, causes the uh, uh, contractions partly, and then also causes milk to ooze, milk letdown. And when the hormones... Uh, get too high, we decrease its release. Okay, it's purely a negative feedback mechanism there. Now, as I said, the three big feedbacks, negative feedbacks you really need to know are these guys here. Okay. That's the three big ones. Okay. So, <clears throat> All right, now thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is going to be produced, guys, by cells, uh, has going to have cells called follicular cells in it. And these follicular cells make two hormones. One is called T3, one is called T4. T4, right here, T4 is T4 tri, I mean tetra, one, two, three, four, tetra iodothyronine, T4. Four iodines, tetra, one, two, three, four iodo, iodines, four iodines, 
T3 made from T4 is 1, 2, 3 iodines. You've lost this iodine here to make T3, which is actually more active because of the missing iodine, makes it bind with greater affinity, so it's usually more of an effective, more potent because of that. Now, they are always bound to transport globulins, thyroid binding globulins in the blood, or transthyretin, a protein called transthyretin, or albumin in the blood. And this is why, for example, if you have thyroid patients, you also monitor these proteins, okay? So you have to understand the reasoning behind the labs and why, if these things are low, why might their T3, T4 levels be, why would the things regulated by these hormones be off? Okay, you have to understand that when you're working with patients. If you don't, they're going to suffer and you might kill somebody. Now, T3 is more potent, has to do with the lack of iodine. Now, the T3, T4s are lipid soluble, but, uh, uh, and so they use a protein. They have to have a protein because they're lipid soluble, so they have to go on some kind of transport binding globulin, a transtheretin, or an albumin molecule. Now, calcitonin, on the other hand, it lowers blood calcium. Um, now, we'll talk about him here. But I'm going to about T3, T4. Now, we've drawn out T3, T4 regulation. Now, T3, T4 pretty much leaves the thyroid itself alone. It leaves your brain alone. It leaves your spleen gonads in the uterus alone with the best we know. That it doesn't affect that. What we know, is it possible we will find that they do? Yes, it's possible. But when it goes to a cell, it causes cells to increase metabolism. These hormones, T3, T4, will bind to the mitochondria and cause it to consume oxygen and make ADB. So this means this is an energy source. This is a hormone that will cause you to have energy. It also is T3, T4 is a hormone that causes heart rate to go up. Very important that you know the things that affect heart rate when you're dealing with cardiovascular patients. So here this makes heart rate go up. Because it makes heart rate go up, it increases blood pressure. Now also it causes bone to mineralize and muscles to develop. And it also, because it increases your metabolism, thereby invariably increases your body heat. Now, these two diseases are not on the test, but I will talk about them. Hyperthyroidism is you overproduce T3, T4. That means the body, you're going to be very skinny, very high energy, very skinny, and very hot. You basically are jittery. People have hyperthyroidism sometimes. They're, it's like their eyeballs are about to pop out of their head. They're feel, they feel very, very anxious. Their heart is beating. I mean, they just, and they're skinny. Now, low T3, T4 is hypothyroidism. That means this person's metabolic rate is so low um, that uh, they tend to gain weight and be overweight. They tend to be very cold and very weak and tired. They have lethargic, lethargy, okay? Now, what is it that causes all this? Now, let's kind of come back and just do a very quick recap of T3, T4 uh, production. This is a very important mechanism, so I want to make sure we understand it. Here we have our hypothalamus one more time. Here we have the anterior pituitary one more time. Here we just have thyroid, okay? Now, the hypothalamus, we know, releases the hormone called thyroid-releasing hormone. And the thyroid-releasing hormone comes to the anterior pituitary and makes that release thyroid-stimulating hormone. Uh, and then the thyroid-stimulating hormone causes T3 and T4 productions. I better put T4, T3, since T4 is used to make T3. Okay. Now the T3, T4, T4, T3 levels go up. Oops, start to get the low battery here. Okay, and that goes up. And we will have a negative feedback mechanism to come back and shut off that. Okay? So, if you have that then basically know that body temperature, if it gets low, 
or T3, T4 levels drop too low, you've lost homeostasis. So thyroid releasing hormone is released, TRH from the hypothalamus, causes TSH to be released from the anterior pituitary, adenohypophysis, which causes T3, T4 from the thyroid follicles to be released into the blood, which gets the T3, T4 levels back up. But not only that, but the blood pressures, blood temperatures go up, okay? And you get back to homeostasis. And then once that level gets up to normal, we turn it back off again and we get it back to negative. We use a negative feedback to get it back. And we're constantly negative feedback. Homeostasis is disturbed. Homeostasis is, 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 is uh, restored. Then it drops back down again. We disturb it. We bring it back. And we just keep doing this at pulses. Okay. Now, calcitonin. Uh, let me see how bad my um, uh, battery is. Okay, it's 10%, so I think I can make it. Okay, now I'm, I don't know. If, I, I'm not going to take time to draw this out this time. I've done it in AMB1. Now, calcitonin is released from parafollicular cells. That's in the thyroid. These are not, this is why, you know, the follicular cells make the thyroid hormones. Calcitonin is parafollicular cells. So this is why it's not considered a thyroid hormone. Now, when there's lots of calcium, it makes blood calcium levels go back down, okay? Now, it lowers blood calcium through negative feedback. It puts the tone in bone. So what does it do? It inhibits osteoclasts, and it stimulates osteoblasts. So it releases calcium from bone, and then causes bone... Uh, it prevents that calcium release, inhibits the osteoclast, osteoclasts release calcium. So if you turn them off, calcium isn't allowed to go higher, then osteoblasts will use that calcium up to make bone stronger, so it puts a tone in bone. Then we pee the calcium ions out, then we don't absorb very much calcium from our diet. We try to inhibit calcium absorption from our diet. Now you should have actually seen that in AMP1. That's why I'm not drawing it out, but reviewing that concept one more time. Calcium levels go back down, and once that happens, calcitonin is no longer needed. But parathyroid gland comes in. There's four of them, two on each side, who releases PTH when blood calcium is low. So when you have a low PTH, PTH levels will cause uh, be released when calcium levels drop and this will make your calcium need to go back up through negative feedback so the chief cells of the parathyroid gland chief cells release the parathyroid hormone and that will make osteoclasts be stimulated who will then eat the bone and release calcium in the blood raising calcium they will go and turn the osteoblasts off, which will make the calcium not be used up. So that prevents the lowering of calcium. So calcium is going up by breaking down bone. We're no longer using, putting, uh, we're no, we don't have enough calcium in the blood, so we don't use it to make bone. Then we come in, guys, and we don't pee it out. We retain the calcium at the kidneys, but, and we also go into our diet and we get any calcium from diet that we can. And this should say from, not form. I do apologize. I uh, try to catch every typo that I possibly can. Um, <clears throat> so this means calcium goes up. Now, there's one thing I always used to tell my, in my classes, I always used to say, flowing, 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 when blood calcium is growing, you need calcitonin. It puts the tone in your bones. It's released from your thyroid just below your hyoid you can understand it just seeing to you can't stand it and inhibit socio class activity bring it up use it down you know bring it up or i mean bring it down use it up cut it out calcitonin but flowing 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 if blood calcium you are low in Get PTH a flowing parathyroid, eating bone together, and releasing calcium whenever it gets below 8.5. Calcium starts arising. It'll be no surprise in its release from the parathyroid glands. Okay. I know it's stupid, but it works, I hope. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to give you at least that because I always sing it to my students as well. So. 
Um, anyway, <laughs> so, uh, this is what they're trying to say. So, um, <clears throat> all righty. Cool beans, cool beans. Now, it's 8.5 to 11 milligrams for deciliters, what they have this homeostatic range. You don't even memorize those. I'll have you memorize um, homeostatic ranges in mill equivalents in fluid and electrolyte. Now, adrenal glands. Now, adrenal glands is on top of the kidneys. And on top of your kidneys, they're your adrenal cord, uh, adrenal glands. And they're, remember, adrenal glands is part of your sympathetic nervous system. Remember, it is giving information from sympathetic nervous system. For the, that's where the preganglionic neurons come in. Or from the endocrine system using ACTH comes in to cause the adrenal glands to release its materials. Either steroid hormones, epinephrine, or epinephrine. Now, there are three layers to our anatomical adrenal gland. There's an outer capsule, a middle cortex, and a deeper medulla. Now, the cortex is three zones to it. Now, to remember the three zones and what they release, imagine when your dad uh, uh, found out, dad found out his daughter was dating. And what did dad say? He says, get my freaking gun right away. Get my freaking gun right away. Glomerulosa, zona glomerulosa, releases mineral corticoids. Get my. That's aldosterone. Freaking gun. Fasciolata releases glucocorticoids right away. Reticularis releases androgens and they can be turned into sex hormones they're androgynous they're without sex they're androgynous the medulla does the epinephrine or epinephrine from those neuroendocrine cells so if you ever ask which uh, adrenal cortex layer produces what get my freaking gun right away gm uh, glomerulosa mineral corticoids and another way to remember the mineral corticoids are aldosterone is gma your gma gma Glomerulosa, mineral corticoids, aldosterone. Get my freaking gun. Fasciolata, glucocorticoids. Right away. Reticularis androgens. Now, what is it the glomerulosa mineral corticoid aldosterone does? Aldosterone is a hugely important hormone. How important? You're going to see it on the test. Okay? This is huge. You must know this. Aldosterone and other mineral corticoids, they're steroids, and they work on the kidneys. Most what these guys will do is they retain sodium and cause you to pee potassium. But not only do they do that, but they cause you to pee out hydrogen ions, affecting the acid-base balance of the body as well. Now, why does this matter, guys? When you're dealing with a patient with a disease called diabetic ketoacidosis it is common for them to get low potassium hypokalemia why aldosterone okay aldosterone causes the loss of hydrogen ions and potassium so the high hydrogen ions will cause aldosterone to kick that out but with it comes the potassium and because they have such abundance of hydrogen ions they get hypokalemia low potassium with it okay this is why uh, diabetic ketoacidosis patients get uh, dka gets hypokalemia and then also there's a hormone called atronatriuretic peptide who turns off aldosterone okay it inhibits aldosterone we're going to talk about him a little bit later so in the fasciolata he makes glucocorticoids. Hydrocortisone is a good example of a glucocorticoid. It's activated, turned on by ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, who came from the anterior pituitary, the adenohypothesis. And he makes me produce glucose. He's going to tell my liver to turn lipids and amino acids into glucose. Okay. He makes my metabolism go in and resist stress. This is a stress hormone. And once the cortisol levels get up too high, this should turn it off. It, unless you have an endocrine dysfunction, adrenal cortex issue, uh, where excess cortisol is produced and you can't turn it off, called Cushing's. Now, zona recticularis androgens. The androgens 
when you have low sex hormones, steroid levels go low for sex hormones, you will start to produce these androgens and can turn them into male and female sex hormones. Now, that's why they are called androgens. They're androgynous. They're not male. They're not female. They're both. Now, they cause in males, well, in females, for example, before you start producing in females and males, before you hit puberty, you're actually starting to produce pubic hair, and that's what causes pubic hair production. So if, let's say somebody has uh, inability to produce and release these androgens, then right there before pubescence, they may not be producing pubic hair. So this could be a pro this uh, lack of pubic hair production uh, near puberty could be a sign of an endocrine malfunction. And then this is high levels uh, of when the androgens are high enough, you turn it off. Negative feedback, negative feedback, negative feedback, you see. All this negative feedback, usually. Now, zona glomerulosa and aldosterone has another hormone to turn it off. Um, so, now, suprarenal medulla, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Now, think back to uh, chapter 16. That is sympathetic nervous system. What does sympathetic nervous system do to the heart rate? Increases it. What does it do to blood pressure? Increases it. What does it do to energy production? Increases it. What does the epinephrine and epinephrine do? Increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, increase energy production. This means it's going to break down fats. This is going to get your body to go into uh, like flight, fight or flight. You got to be ready to deal with problems. That's what you want. Sympathetic stimulation can be done without a neuron because of the suprarenal medulla. Okay, it just allows me to go to a place where there aren't neurons, sympathetic neurons, uh, because remember, you got even though you have the superior, middle, and inferior cervical ganglia in the neck, doesn't you can't get to every tissue in the upper part of the body, and there's places where your epinephrine or epinephrine need to get to where you don't have uh, sympathetic neurons. Okay. Pineal glands in the back of the brain primarily produces mood-altering chemicals. Uh, melatonin is a big one. Melatonin is what makes you sleepy. It mellows you out, so it makes you drowsy and sleepy. It sets your body clock. We call this circadian rhythm, circa, around, dia, a day, around a day. Things that occur around a day. What happens is when it gets dark, that starts to turn on its release. But when there's low light conditions, uh, it's released. But when there's light present, it turns it off. This is why it's not good to try to go to bed and be watching a bright screen. And this is also involved in seasonal depressive disorders. Now, things like serotonin and dopamine and also histamines are produced here as well. Okay, the ENs, serotonin, dopamine. Serotonin, we know, makes you feel good. Dopamine also makes you feel good. Now, the pancreas. Pancreas makes, this is a very important endocrine gland. This is producing glucagon, insulin, pancreatic polypeptide, and growth hormone inhibiting hormone. And I really wish I'd gone in here and boop, did that, but you know. You know me now, by now. You're like, he's going to edit while he's teaching it. Um, I, I, I just can't stand it when there's a thing there that needs to be done, and I don't see it when I'm actually reviewing my notes. I only see it when I'm teaching, so I, I apologize. <laughs> so it's mixed gland. Why? Because it actually has endocrine and exocrine. Now remember, endocrine goes into the blood, endo blood. Exocrine goes into a duct. So the exocrine cells are called the pancreatic acini cells. Acini cells will go into ducts like the pancreatic duct. They make enzymes, whereas islets, they make the hormones. They're endocrine cells. Islets is endocrine. Islets is endocrine. Now, what are islets? Well, our islets are a little bit like a party. Here we have a party. Here's a party. And this party is an islet party. This is an islet, pancreatic islet, or islet of Langerhans. Islet of Langerhans, okay? I'm just going to say islet, pancreatic islet. Now, it's like a party. Now, who is always the center of attention at a party? It's always going to be a beautiful woman. The beautiful woman is always the center of attention. And at a party, who is it that surrounds beautiful women? Alpha males. 
Alpha males will always surround beautiful women. Now, there's other people at this party. Some of these guys are never going to get a date with this beautiful woman. Why? Because these guys are dogs, Delta sales. And some of these guys are her friends, and she's not going to date her friends, F sales. So Islets have beta sales, alpha sales, delta sales, F sales. Okay? Now, so think about this like a party where a beautiful woman is the center of attention surrounded by many alpha males, and then the other guys at the party are either just ugly, they're dogs, or they're friends of hers. Okay, and she's not going to date them. She's not going home with them that night. Alpha sales, these are making glucagon. You know, an alpha male comes to you and he tries to sweet talk. He tries to bring you sugary goodies and says, honey, you're just so beautiful. You know, here, let me bring you goodies. He's always trying to raise your sugar. He's trying to raise the sugar. He is going to cause the breakdown of glucose. He's going to go take uh, uh, glycogen and break it down to glucose. Now, beta cells, you beta know the beta cells make insulin, lower blood glucose levels. Delta cells make GHIH, growth hormone inhibiting hormone, or somatostatin. F cells make pancreatic polypeptides, and they actually turn your gallbladder off. So there is a digestive function endocrine here too. Okay? Okay, so let's take a look at how pancreas does this thing. Now, the first thing I want to make sure you guys understand, a big thing you need to understand is that glucose's range for a normal human being is between 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. And this is a value you need to memorize. You will see this by the end of the semester at some point on a test. You will see it. I won't guarantee it on this one, but it will be out there sometime. But it is a thing you need to know is normal glucose is 70 to 110. Now, we're not getting to A1C. A1C is when you have glucose glycated hemoglobin. Glucose sticks to the hemoglobins and things like that. That is a measure of, of one's um, uh, sugar levels and diabe how, how, how well they're doing and maintaining their diabetes. And do they need to go on sulfonylurea? Uh, do they need to go on something alongside of metformin? Uh, so especially if they're type 2 diabetic because uh, you know you, they're insulin resistant so it doesn't matter insulin is peptide hormone made by beta cells now when do you produce it is when there's high levels of glucose so what does it do is it takes and gets glucose in it gets the sugar into the cells insulin gets sugar in okay so if the insulin gets sugar in one of the things it does is it takes the liver and skeletal muscles and fat and it removes it from blood to cells. It takes the glucose from the cell or less it gets the insulin again. Okay. It uptakes insulin in places like liver, muscle, and fat. Now it also causes you to produce ATP. If you can accelerate glucose utilization in ATP production, this means you'll burn down the glucose to make ATP. Remember, AMP1, we learned an equation that, uh, uh, that six oxygens plus a glucose makes six CO2, six waters, and 36 to 38 ATPs. That's why you learned that, okay? Is that if I can increase ATP production, I will increase glucose breakdown. We also will make glycogen. Glycogen is a polysaccharide of glucose, a storage uh, polysaccharide for glucose. So if you can take glucose and put it into polysaccharide uh, glycogen, then you lower glucose. Now, if I can take amino acids and proteins and I can absorb amino acids and I can protein do protein synthesis with those amino acids, I cannot do glucogenesis, it's called. It prevents turning amino acids and glucose, amino acids that the body has into glucose. Because the liver can take amino acids and lipids and other things and say, hey, let me turn that to sugar. I mean, you can do that. Now, guys, that's literally the thing you'll talk about uh, in pathophys, okay, is, is the fact that you can turn fat back to glucose and turn glucose into fat, okay? Glucose to lipids. That's one of the things we do with with, uh, with this. You turn glucose to fat. 
and then we get it back to normal. Now, glycogen, again, 70 to 110. This is a peptide by alpha cells. And low, uh, it, it, it's released when you have low glucose. So when glucose is gone, glucagon. Sounds like a commercial. And this gets energy reserves going. It takes my fat and breaks it down back to sugars. So this actually converts triglycerides back to glucose. So it's important that you know that. You will see this in patho. It actually will take glucoses and liver will make glucose from other things. It's called glucogenesis. And then it will also uh, break down glycogen. Okay, break down glycogen found in like muscle and liver cells. Okay, and it raises it back up to normal. So you do need to know those two. Big deal. Okay, big deal. And this is what they're trying to say here, but guys, trust me. And I will test you guys on like insulin or glucagon or both or one. So you're all going to see one of those two. Now, I always like to make sure you understand th six hormones who are responsible to increase the blood glucose for a patient. Because these are important to look after. They're called the stingy hormones. They're stingy. Kind of like sten, like the sten gun. If you guys, anybody here play, anybody listening, play Battlefield 5. Um, so the sten G, sten G, sten G, G, sten G, G. So it's stingy with glucose, somatotropin or growth hormone, thyroid hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucagon, and glucocorticoids. All these hormones, STEN, S-T-E-N-G-G, STEN-G hormones, somatotropin or growth hormone, thyroid hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucagon, and glucocorticoids, all raise blood glucose. And these are all things that they're elevated. You need to be watching your patient's glucose levels, A1C levels, things like that. Uh, keeping an eye on those, okay, especially if they have other problems. This is why people who have glucocorticoid uh, problems, like um, uh, which is Cushing's, uh, have high glucose. Thymus, <clears throat> it stimulates the maturation of white blood cells. Thymosins make your white blood cells be produced. We'll talk about the thymus more in the lymphatic and immunity. The gonads release estrogen progesterone that, uh, and that's used uh, for the ovaries and for males' testes produce testosterone. More in the repro. Okay, that's, we've already basically said it. I'm just kind of, now I do want to mention that kidneys make a hormone called calcitriol. You might know that vitamin D3 called the calciferol is sent to the liver, then to the kidneys to be releasing vitamin D3. Uh, to absorb calcium in the gut alongside of parathyroid hormone. Erythropoietin is made by the kidneys, and that causes you to stimulate red blood cell development. Now, renin is an enzyme and not a hormone, but important that you know it's made by the kidneys for increased blood pressure. We will talk about renin more later, and by the time we get to uh, exam two, when we get to the blood uh, vessels and stuff, we will be talking about renin and aldosterone quite a lot. And those will be important for you guys to understand as you go down the road. Atrial natriuretic peptide. Uh, excretion. Excretion, not exertion. Excretion. 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 That's my fault. I apologize for not catching that. Uh, excretion of sodium makes you pee sodium. Atrial from the heart. Natri natrium was was sodium. Sodium on the periodic table is Na. That's why it's Na because it was natrium. Na natriuretic P. This is a protein hormone that causes you to pee sodium. Okay. Now I will have a question on stress. Stress is easy, really. This is just anything that changes homeostasis can be a stress, especially severe changes to homeostasis. Now, if it's a physical stress, that'd be like I'm sick, I'm injured, I'm starving, I'm not getting oxygen. So, like, for example, that could be caused by an environmental stress or a metabolic stress, like starvation, Metabolic ketoacidosis, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis, things like that. Uh, environmental stresses could be I'm stra stranded outside in extreme temperatures or, you know, extreme hot, extreme cold, extreme wet. 
extreme dry, things like that. Physiological stress are things that happen inside. And this is commonly caused by things like depression and anxiety, which are stresses, which will influence the changes in, in, in hormones, can actually affect mental states, can actually begin to affect brain and actually cause brain issues, change your brain forever. Now, the general adaptation syndrome is actually the things that can cause much of the problems uh, that P uh, PTSD kind of comes out of this. So the stress response. Now, stress causing factors. Now, basically, what you guys are going through right now is a stress causing factor. You're going through this class. Now, luckily, this class lasts for one semester, which is just about long enough. So the general adaptation syndrome stops. Let me go on. So. The stress response it is three phases, alarm phase, resistance phase, and exhaustion phase. Now, alarm phase, that's when the alarm thing happens. That's when you find out, that's your immediate response. If I were to say there's an exam tomorrow, there's not, okay? There's an exam coming up next week. Okay, there is. Probably, if you're listening to this right now, probably next week's your exam. Now, this means that's the immediate response to that stress. Whatever you guys immediately do, you say, okay, that's my response to that stress. And that's your fight or flight mechanism. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, gets you in your fight or flight. Then we're going to see a resistance phase. That's when your body starts to reduce the impact that the stressor has. Then after a while of doing this for a long time, you then go into an exhaustion phase where your immunity is lost. So you have increased risk of infections, high blood pressure, hypertensive, heart attacks, heart disease, stroke, all kinds of bad things with the exhaustion phase. So PTSD can go in there with this a little bit, okay? This uh, especially, so basically what happens is, is if you constantly been through stressful environments like combat, and we are always on edge and never get to come down from that long enough, it almost becomes where you're basically what your body is going to be doing is taking non-life-threatening situations and treating as if it were life-threatening situations, okay? Uh, these are not on exam. These are some diseases I've included, uh, some common diseases, but this one will be on the test. There is one question on type 1 or type 2 diabetes uh, or diabetes insipidus, but I'm going to say type 1, type 2, okay? Now, Type 1, you don't, there's a type of sugar diabetes called diabetes mellitus. Type 1, you don't make insulin. Now, why is it? Well, one way you get it is born with it, genetics. You can be born with some messed up genes in the sequence that causes you to make insulin. The insulin, um, insulin production pathway could be messed up. Uh, the gene that codes for insulin, the genes that codes for the enzymes that cleave insulin in its active state, or some other genes cause type 1, uh, or your beta cells are damaged by antibodies. Now, typically we get a virus, we get a viral infection, your body starts, and these proteins on the virus are close enough to the proteins found on beta cells and your antibodies that you've made will bind and attack that. And I'm not sure which virus does it. There, I know there's usually for these diseases, there's a virus that has those proteins, one or two viruses that most likely cause it. I don't know if we know which one it is yet. But the, the, the main hypothesis is, is that the virus you get as proteins on its surface that are much like the proteins found on the beta cells, and the beta cells are then attacked by antibodies produced against that virus, and so then you can't absorb glucose, and glucose levels are high, so we call this type 1 is the insulin dependence. You take insulin, and you can live on, you can live. You take insulin. Now, that all that insulin is GMO. Uh, you go through, and we, we, we take uh, bacteria. Uh, we we, we, um, we uh, uh, insert uh, the genes for making insulin, and then the bacteria produce insulin. We collect it, and we give it like Humalog. 
whereas it would take about 10,000 pounds of pig pancreases to make one pound of in purified insulin before. Now, type 2 is the adult onset one that is developed because of how we live. It's in the developed world, especially the United States. It cannot respond to insulin, so it's insulin resistance. Obesity is the major cause. Uh, there's some things involved there with something called tumor necrosis factor. We do know. Um, you guys will learn, though, whenever type of diabetes you get, you're going to end up getting macrophages. They're going to get exposed to the chemicals in the blood. They're going to be turned into a thing called a foam cell. Foam cells are going to enter the blood vessels and attack the blood vessel lining, causing the damage of, of blood. And you'll learn that in classes like patho. Now, diabetes insipidus, on the other hand, you either can't make ADH in the brain or the kidney can't respond to ADH, so you pee a lot. Excessive water loss and electrolyte loss. So this usually causes low potassium, or low sodium levels. Diabetes insipidus, you pee like mad. Okay, patient will pee like mad. If it's not produced, if the brain doesn't produce ADH, if you're not producing it, we call that central Diabetes insipidus, if your kidneys can't respond to ADH, we call that nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. But I'm just adding a few things. And I, look at this. The darker the red, the darker the colors, the more diabetes type 2, the lighter the colors, the less. And what do you see right here, guys? In the south, the blood sugar should rise again. We are the buckle of the diabetes belt here in good old Tennessee. Uh, this is uh, biscuits and gravy and sweet tea right here. And I love biscuits and gravy, and I love sweet tea. So <laughs> um, let's just hope I don't get diabetes. Um, Cushing's. You just can't um, turn off... Um, it's a failure to do negative feedback uh, with this mechanism. So basically, it puts people at risk for high blood pressure, bone loss, uh, diabetes, all kinds of problems. This, basically, what happens is the redness here is actually your body in need of protein will go in and start to consume the dermal tissues for protein. That's what's causing that extreme redness is you're actually consuming your own dermal tissues for proteins. Um, uh, Addison's, this is good old JFK, he had Addison's, the dark complexedness that he had, he was fairly tall, very slim, uh, he does, he, you don't have enough cortis, uh, insufficient cortisol and often not enough aldosterone as well, uh, but the adrenal glands could be damaged, uh, due to some reasons, uh, genetic conditions, things like that, but basically, uh, it's a loss of negative feedback, uh, from the adrenal glands to the anterior pituitary, so so you end up being tall, slim, and dark complected. So, guys, this concludes it. I think I was going to do it in three, and I'm doing it in two. Um, so I apologize. I'll just adjust the, I'll just adjust the title. <laughs> so, thank you. This concludes my video. Please go over the notes again. Go over the chapter reviews and take the quizzes. All right. Thank you.